This is our 51st study in the book of Psalms. We come today to Psalm 115. We begin our study in verse 1. We will go through Psalm 116. Let's see, verse uh, 11. That's the plan anyway. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. For thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. In other words, don't draw attention to us. Let us draw attention to you. Or draw attention to yourself through us. This person has a heart for God. You want God to be lifted up. What he is saying is spread your fame, God. Not ours. Some have it backwards today. Oh, there have always been those who have called themselves Christians from the very beginning. Who wanted to draw attention to themselves. They had it backwards. Some today say, some today they don't say, but they do use God to make a name for themselves. Some Christian singers do. It's disgusting how some of them act. Some preachers are extremely disgusting in how they act and the things that they say, trying to make a name for themselves, a, a religious empire for themselves. It's disgusting. They use God to make a name for themselves. And we should always let God use us to make a name for Him. Everyone who calls themselves a Christian should work to draw people's attention to Jesus, not to themselves. Why should the heathen say, Where now is their God? In other words, promote God. Talk about God. Why should the heathen say there is no God? Or where is He? What's he like? God is instructing us to tell people what he has done and how he has answered prayer and just about how alive he is. Talk about the living God. Why should anyone say, God, who's God? Or God is dead? Or he's not real? He never was? Talk about him. Talk about the living God so people know that he is alive and well and he hears prayers and he does things. Why should the heathen say, Where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatever he hath pleased. God, people say, Where's God? Well, he's in heaven. But he's here too. And he does whatever he pleases. He doesn't lose. God gets his way. Because he is God. God says, From ancient days, I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? That's why Jesus said, No one takes my life. I lay it down of my own will. Nobody could have murdered Jesus without his consent. Jesus wasn't caught off guard by Pontius Pilate or by Judas. He was no man's victim. Jesus died on the cross because he wanted to pay for our sins. Our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatever he hath pleased. For their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. So our God does whatever he pleases. No one can stop him. No man can stop him. That's compared to false gods who are made by men. What kind of God is that? Boy, people really have to be into playing games they have to really be into playing make-believe or let's pretend if they worship a God that they themselves have made you got to be sick worship a God that you bought at Kmart now let's make this statue let's pretend it's God and if we pretend hard enough we'll forget that there's a real God who we are accountable to and that's exactly why they do it Five. 
Let's read four along with it. This describes false gods. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. In other words, they're all for show. Decoration. Beyond that, they're useless. If you need the right words to say in some situation, don't ask them, because they can't speak at all. If you're going in for eye surgery, don't ask them for help. Or don't ask them to guide the doctor's hands, because they can't see at all. Don't pray to them, because they can't hear. Don't ask them to come to you when you need help, because they cannot walk. And they can't fly and they can't move. And sure, don't ask them for advice because they can't talk. And even if they could talk, they don't have a brain. They're hollow. They're nothing. Useless. No God is a God except the God of Holy Scripture. 8. They that make them are like unto them. So is anyone who trusteth in them. Useless. You worship a nothing God, you're going to end up nothing. Anyone who makes and trusts in gods that are nothing will be just like their gods, so-called. That's what God says. They're going to be just like them. Foolish, useless, destined for destruction. Twisted in your thinking. Useless. You say, why is that? Well, because God said it here, but also Jesus said a student is no greater than their master. Likewise, one cannot become greater than the God that they serve. You're not going to become any greater than the God that you worship and serve and that you look to for direction. You're not going to be any greater than them. And the bar is set pretty low when it comes to idols. Very low. For those who worship nothing, useless gods. 9. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. God is not the help and shield of everyone. He is the help and shield of those who fear Him. God is a shield to those who choose to take refuge in Him. God is a shield. But God is also a gentleman. He doesn't force Himself on anyone. He would love to protect all people for all eternity. But he will not protect unless he is asked. God doesn't crash anyone's party or crash into anyone's life. God is the kind of God that waits to be invited. He doesn't save anyone by force. He waits to be invited. If somebody doesn't want him, he lets them go their own way. 12. The Lord hath been mindful of us he will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will. And he's telling this to people who probably are going through some hard times. But he's reminding them, God will bless you. When God, for whatever reason, known only to him, allows trouble in our life, do not buy the lie that Satan may throw your way. God doesn't care. Or God has forgotten about you. Don't buy it. God's past goodness proved that we are important to Him. And He will bless again if we belong to Jesus Christ. 13. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. See, He will bless both small and great. The important thing is, do you fear the Lord? That's who He's going to bless. God does not favor the rich over the poor. 
the young over the old. He doesn't he doesn't favor the black over the white or the white over the black. Because we're all the same to him. We're all just the work of his hands. The thing God looks for is are we good? Do we fear him? And do we show that we fear him by how we live? By living for him and confessing when we fail and repenting when we fail. 14. The Lord shall increase you more and more. You and your children. Ye are blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. We are blessed by the God who made heaven and earth. Those who think that since the God who made the heaven and the earth has done big things like that, those who think that there's no way somebody that big would lower himself to bless people, do not know God. He's a huge God. He is an infinitely complicated, infinitely holy God, infinitely powerful God. He did make all the heavens, and He did make the earth. He made it all, and He keeps it all going, and He keeps it all in place. And yet, don't think that He doesn't notice you, because He does. And He cares about each one of us. He cares about the little sparrow. He cares about the little flower in the field that nobody else sees. So he's huge, but at the same time he's caring toward, you know, just insignificant things. Nothing is insignificant to God, really. Verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's. But the earth hath he given to the children of men. The heavens are ruled by God. And he has delegated the rule of the earth to people. And that's why things do not operate as well here as they do in heaven. He's running the show up there. He's delegated man to do it down here. That's why there's greater happiness in heaven than there is on earth. Things are going much better up in heaven than they are here. That's why Jesus instructed us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither do any that go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. I won't be teaching any scripture from my coffin. So don't bother showing up at the cemetery on Sunday mornings. You waste your time. It says, The dead praise not the Lord. They don't teach either. None of us are going to be singing songs to God from our coffin, even if we're all buried in the same area. You know, it won't matter. People can come out there, they're not going to see or hear any singing on, on Sunday morning. And so what we're going to do for God in this world, we have to do right now while we're here. Psalm 116. I love the Lord because He hath heard my voice. And my supplications. He loved him. He loved God because God heard his prayer. A good reason to love God is that he hears our prayer and he answers our prayer. You say, well, I don't have warm feelings toward God. So I guess I don't love him. What do warm feelings have to do with anything? We show our love to God by keeping his commandments. Remember what Jesus said? If you love me, have warm feelings about me. He didn't say that. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. Prayer is worth doing because it gets through to God. Prayer is worth doing because God actually listens to our prayers. The writer says, as long as God is listening, I'm going to pray. And why not? That makes sense, doesn't it? If God takes the time to incline his ear to you, 
you must take the time to pray because you know he's going to hear you as long as you don't have any unconfessed sin in your life. Three. This guy was in trouble. The sorrows of death encompass me. And the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. So he was in rough shape. He was just about dead. And he was terrified. Does the sorrows of death encompass me? The pains of hell got a hold of me. He was troubled and sorrowful. He was terrified and he was sad because he thought for sure that he was going to die. And he's a holy man. But I don't care how holy a person is. The thought of death can be a little frightening. Like I've said in the past, if for no other reason, then you've never done it before. Besides, you know what? Death is unnatural. It died a natural death. You ever hear that one? There's no such thing as a natural death. It's unnatural. God didn't create things to die. He didn't give life to things so that they would die. He create, created things so that they would live. Death is terrifying, and it makes people sad, because it's not natural. Plus, you've never done it before. Plus, you have to say goodbye to friends and family. The whole thing is unnatural. It's not right. But it happens because of sin. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. His back was to the wall. His need was desperate. So he got right to the point with his prayer. There were no useless words. There were no vain repetitions in his prayer. There really aren't in circumstances like that. Oh, by the way, not all repetitious prayer is wrong. It only becomes wrong when it's vain repetition. But then any prayer is a waste of time. You know, if you're just praying because you think God will hear you because of your many words, well, that's ridiculous. Then you're like the Hindus who have the prayer wheel. Spin that prayer wheel. It's like a roulette thing. And every time it spins, it counts as one prayer. That's stupid. That's what you call vain repetition. Nothing wrong with vain repetitions. There's nothing wrong with repetition as long as it's not vain. But there was nothing vain uh, there was nothing that even came close to vain repetitions in his prayer. And that's because great trouble results in great prayer. To the point prayers from the heart prayers. Five. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. It is God's nature to be merciful. It is God's nature to be compassionate. He is full of mercy. He wants to show compassion. But He cannot. Unless we meet His righteous requirements first. If someone really repents of their sin and really starts obeying God, God's not going to punish. He'll show compassion to that person. Verse 6, The Lord preserveth the simple I was brought low, and he helped me. Slick talkers who are full of deceit and full of double talk can get pretty far in this world by their own craftiness, at least for a while. They take advantage of a lot of people with their smooth words. But those who are not crafty, those who simply do what is right and trust God, will come out better in the long run. Verse 7. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Actually, I, yeah, let's read that again. Return unto thy rest, O soul, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Now, words, just trust God and relax. God has dealt bountifully with you. Trust Him and relax. Even if you're going through hard times, 
Remember, God has dealt bountifully with you. If we know that God will make sure that everything will be okay, be okay in the long run, we should be able to make it through any temporary bad times. We should be able to return unto our rest. We should be able to have soul rest, peace of mind. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with us. He has promised. He has paid for our sins. He has made a way for us to be in heaven. If we know everything is going to be okay in the long run because we're walking with the Lord, we should be able to make it through any temporary hard times. It shouldn't be that big of a deal. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. Notice verse 8 says that God delivers us from three basic things. Death, tears, and stumbling. God delivers us from death. We're going to die. And this, we're one of the few fortunate ones who are alive maybe when Jesus returns. We're going to die. But God delivers us from death. Even then we'll come back. Even then we're going to live again. God will save us from death. God will also save us from tears. That means grief. Extreme grief. He delivers our eyes from tears. When you know that you're not going to hell, and you know that your future is great, why wallow in grief over things that at first make us sad? Sure, something happens. We lose someone or something bad happens. We can be sad. We can have some grief. But why in the world wallow over it? Why in the world stay in it when you know that your future is great? That's why the Bible says that we sorrow, but not as those who have no hope. The future is bright for us. Why would we sorrow like those who have no hope? So God delivers us from death, from grief, and from stumbling. That means dishonor. God delivers us from dishonor. And that goes along with Him delivering us from sin. Sin brings shame and dishonor. To one degree or another, it brings shame and dishonor. But someday all sin is going to be gone. We will not even come close to sinning. Therefore, we will never again experience shame. Listen, we're going to be free of sin. We're going to be free of even the desire of sin. We will not commit any sin at all, of any form, in our mind, in our actions, in our words. We're going to be living in a sinless body, in a sinless environment. So, there's not going to be any shame. Remember, Adam and Eve, they didn't feel any shame. They were together. They were naked. They didn't, even, they didn't feel any shame because they were totally innocent. The moment that they sinned, they went and tried to cover themselves because they were ashamed of themselves. So God delivers us from death, from tears, and from shame. 9. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. That means right here. The land of the living is right here. Now, it's possible to live in the presence of God and enjoy His company. Right here on earth, right now. But to enjoy God on earth, we must be self-disciplined and we have to be holy. And that's what it means to walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Be self-disciplined, be holy, and you'll enjoy His company even right now. 10. I believe, therefore I have spoken. I was greatly afflicted. He says, He believed, therefore He spoke. In other words, his faith kept him going. His troubles were severe, but his faith kept him going. His faith kept him on his knees. He believed. Consequently, he spoke. That, in other words, he talked to God in prayer. Hard times make us pray harder if we have faith. Dangerous times make us pray harder if we have faith. I believe Therefore, I have spoken. I believe, in other words. Therefore, I have prayed even harder. 
I believe, therefore I have spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. He shouldn't have, he shouldn't have spoke that because he's spoken in haste. There's a warning for us. Don't speak in haste. Be very slow to speak. Measure your words carefully. He was angry. And while blowing off steam, you know, he opened up his mouth. And that was a big mistake. He said something that wasn't true. Best to keep our mouth shut when we're so angry that we can't even think straight. That's because often what is spoken is not true. And often it's just regretted for that reason. Should have never said it. I was angry. Should have never said it. But I was just blown off steam. Better to stay away from... Better just to zip your mouth shut when you're angry. Just going to make matters worse.